thank you for coming this uh, the session or choosing this session. I know that you had a choice, and I appreciate we appreciate that you 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 chose this uh, very controversial uh, the topic this afternoon. Um, uh, uh, as you know, the, the energy policy, energy strategy uh, uh, means uh, very very broad implications. So the and we just only have one hour and fifteen minutes, so it's almost impossible. We can discuss on this issue for for one day long. So the, I try to keep the, the discussion pr uh, concise, so the, the separated the issue into the breakdown the issues, uh, three topics. First is how should Japan and the world treat nuclear energy, energy after the accident? That is quite obvious uh, the topic for today. And the second one is having uh, discussed this topic, uh, which energy would replace nuclear? Can renewable sustain, uh, substitute for the nuclear? That is another very big debate. The third one is having discussed those, uh, uh, we like to touch upon what would be the best energy mix, best energy strategy for Japan after 311, and uh, uh, what are the key issues behind. So the, we'd like to, 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 to move on, on, on those orders. Uh, next. Uh, uh, being the moderator and being the representative, not the power company, power supplier, uh, one of the biggest power user, I try to be very, very uh, objective or third party kind of position uh, <clears throat> for this uh, session. But uh, let me give you some uh, background information. Here is the nuclear re reactors currently exist in Japan, which uh, are of 54 in numbers and uh, 49 gigawatt capacity, supplying uh, 270 terawatt hour uh, in 1997. Uh, focusing on the uh, uh, northern part of Japan, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, reactors, and obviously everyone knows that uh, Fukushima number one was, uh, uh, was hit and uh, now currently under trouble. But uh, interestingly, there are many other reactors uh, uh, being hit by the same tsunami, same earthquake under operation and uh, calmly and uh, uh, slowly shut down and uh, now uh, under the cold uh, cool down situation. So the implication of this fact is that uh, we did have the worked technology and the didn't work technologies. So what uh, we can learn from that? The, the relating up on this issue, uh, if you look at uh, the, the world, uh, particularly China, uh, the, the, they have now 13 reactors in operation and uh, 30 more reactors under constructions. And uh, uh, beyond China, uh, currently more than 100 reactors are under construction or seriously uh, planned to be constructed in very few uh, in, in, in a very few uh, near future so the the nuclear renaissance has not been ended uh, it is still going on uh, the, uh, whether Japan continue nuclear or not is a huge big debate but uh, that that debate uh, must also relate to the, the rest of the world, uh, rest of the, the world uh, in addition to Japan. So well, those are the, the facts I'd like to raise before uh, starting uh, uh, the, the topic one. And uh, now I'd like to ask uh, the panelists to comment on uh, this, uh, the first issue. Uh, well, it's, it, it's certainly a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, I, I'd, I'd like to point out um, three points which I think are necessary on the nuclear issue, uh, simply because they're, they're, in a sense, they're easy to understand and, they're, and, they're, and they get to the core of the problem. There, there's a, an essentially a cognitive dissonance taking place. On the one hand, as you all know, of the 54 reactors that uh, are currently uh, exist in Japan, uh, I believe the, at late count, there are only 10 that are currently operational of the 54. Uh, the reason, uh, despite the fact that the 30 percent or so of total electricity on a kilowatt hour basis has uh, not resulted in uh, blackouts in Japan are, are partly because of what the Japanese call setsuden, 
meaning energy conservation, uh, and the ability of such companies as Tokyo Electric Power Corporation and others to actively increase fossil fuel generated power through a variety of means, both through what the Japanese call uh, jika, uh, jika meaning self-generation, which has been brought online uh, from uh, electric power corporations and uh, companies as well uh, to promote that, uh, as well as demand related issues like uh, cool biz, which is controlled that. So currently there are no blackouts, uh, which uh, leads to the issue of when these power reactors will come online. Uh, and unfortunately, as you all know, with the notable exception of one power company uh, reactor in Hokkaido, um, NIMBY politics, the not in my backyard politics, have prevented the reactors from coming back online. So the natural question you probably would have is, well, when will these nuclear power reactors come back online? Well, I, I can tell you that this is where we get into the wonderful issue of mixed messages, because um, uh, nuclear power exports continue. Uh, Toshiba and Hitachi have already won uh, several bids uh, internationally, and they actually factor into their uh, profit and loss statements moving forward, the further construction of nuclear power plants. And if you were to ask them, do you envision this continuing, the answer is yes. Second, Kedanren. Uh, as well as many business organizations have made their thoughts also very clear. They believe that nuclear power should and will continue for issues of price competitiveness uh, and the uh, objective needs to deal with the Kyoto Protocol in dealing with carbon dioxide emission reductions, which nuclear power supposedly uh, aids as a base load electric power generation. Uh, and the third and perhaps most uh, interesting point in the political issue is the gubernatorial elections which have been won on pro-nuclear power platforms. There have been four, uh, two of notably uh, in Fukui and Hokkaido, where pro-nuclear sentiments have been expressed and the governors have won re-election as a result of of these platforms. So you have sort of a cognitive dissonance or maybe a mixed messages which are currently happening now in Japan uh, between the anti-nuclear uh, lobbyists, the uh, local governments and municipal governments uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, and the bureaucracies, the electric power corporations, and of course uh, the Kedanren and other business uh, business and po uh, political agents who, who believe that pro-nuclear issues are important. What will happen moving forward? I think it's safe to say in the short term that nuclear power for at least the next 12 months will uh, basically stay offline as a political issue. It really comes down to the media, uh, in my view, and how the media, uh, is in particular the five national dailies, uh, take uh, as a position on nuclear power. Uh, what will the Sanke, the Nikkei, the Asahi, uh, the Yomiuri uh, take uh, moving forward on nuclear. And, and right now, the issue of fuhen futo, that is to say, just the facts, ma'am, uh, no political position will be taken, seems to take over. Uh, now, it, my, it is my view that if the Japanese media changes their position on nuclear power, it's very likely that you'll see a shift in electoral sentiments, which are all already highly anti nuclear, but not necessarily uh, uh, damaging simply because of the alternatives. There has been no credible alternative put in place yet. And so I, I would point to you as a matter of fact that we have to wait and see for the next 12 months on what the Japanese media decides its position on nuclear power is, not necessarily the other actors who have not changed their position at all uh, since this crisis has begun. It's been very polarized. And so it is my view uh, that media uh, is the deciding factor on the nuclear issue moving forward. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I come from Fujitsu Research Institute. The Fujitsu Group is a major IT provider, as you might know. So my views are a little bit different uh, because I do not tend to look at the supply side. I rather, rather look at the demand side of energy. Supply side means how you generate it, what are the sources, where you come from. Demand side means, well, what do you do with electricity? How do you deal with electricity? And how efficient are you with electricity? My main point will be probably throughout the discussion is, well, no matter where it comes from, probably it will be a portfolio of different, different uh, sources, it depends how efficient, how productive are you with this important source, which is not only 10% of your, of your GDP, which is also the source basically of any industry doing anything. Uh, from that perspective, 
Basically, the demand side's perspective is nuclear energy has been on the way out in almost all uh, uh, mature economies and societies. Uh, there has been a talk about a renaissance which has been uh, interrupted by Fukushima right now. Uh, even France is not building any nuclear reactors anymore. Most others will probably not, uh, not do so as well. Uh, in Japan, no new nuclear reactors will be probably planned over the next century or something. So from our demand side perspective, it is, well, when we just calculate, the best, the best case would be by 2020, 12% nuclear uh, left in the, red, uh, in the grid. Simply because, well, you calculate 40 years lifetime, extending that is not an option anymore after disaster and management problems. So when you just calculate 12% would be left best case. Perhaps we are out of nuclear energy next year. The question is, if this is the market we are dealing in, how do we deal with this? We can whine, we can bring in our engineers who tell everybody, every customer that they are stupid, that it's safe or whatever. Usually, well, trying to convince your customers is a very, very difficult approach, dealing with the media and everything. So forget about that. That would be my point. It would be, what are the options then? Exporting it overseas? Yes, well, this is what the Germans tried. The Germans from 2000, 2001, they had a law to get out of nuclear. So companies like Siemens, they had all this technology, the current situation in Japan. They knew, well, there is not really a way, so they said, let's export it. We are so brilliant. We have the capital, we have the technology, and we have this huge demand in emerging countries where certainly the nuclear, well, revolution, whatever, will go on because they need to use any power source in their portfolio. Nuclear will be minor, but it will be huge in size because of the development. The problem is, as a market, again, the demand side view, as long as you do not something at home, people will not trust you overseas. This is true for any manufacturer of any product. This is true, of course, for energy in particular, because to export Nuclear technology, you need three, th three things. You need the technology, you need the capital, and you need the management. Governance is the biggest issue for emerging countries. Not the technology. Governance, how to make it safe. And Fukushima is the prime case for that. The problem now that Japan has in terms of exporting this technology is, well, you need, well, for the three things you need, is capital guarantees come from the government. Nuclear is always big business. You need big capital, big guarantees behind this, always government. Uh, Japan's government is not in a position to underwrite this anymore. Simply running out of money, having different other problems. The technology is, here, is there, yeah, some, some companies, but as long as you're not really doing it at home anymore, you're in tremendous trouble to convince your customers when competition is there. The third thing you need is the operations, the governance, and these are always the utilities. Wherever you go, to India, wherever, it is usually TEPCO or another uh, utility that drives the project on back on government guarantees. TEPCO is quite busy right now at home with all sorts of things which are, well, connected to nuclear but not the development of nuclear anymore. So the contracts you're seeing right now are old contracts. They are signed. After that you run into trouble. Siemens, for example, in Germany went to France to become, well, a technology provider or something under the framework of the, the French government, Areva, the really big company. As this minority shareholder, they didn't succeed, they didn't go anywhere. Then they said, okay, let's do emerging directly, go to Russia. And they now gave up on that because it's nasty, it's not really profitable, it produces many problems. So they said, well, let's look at the markets, let's look at our future and what we can do as a company, what we can do in terms of technology, move on. It was an idea, it didn't work for different reasons, move on. And this is probably the position Japan is right now. Thank you. Uh, let me comment uh, from uh, TEPCO, the epicenter of this problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, as uh, Mr. Kitagami mentioned on the plenary session this morning, uh, the Fukushima accident, nuclear accident this time, is more about crisis management than technology problem. Although the Fukushima Daiichi unit is the first generation of the uh, light water reactor made by uh, General Electric, it is uh, the first generation. Because it is a uh, first generation, there are many, many uh, potential problems. Uh, but uh, this case, every possible measure to meet earthquake worked quite well. It was not widely reported, but before the tsunami uh, hit, 
Fukushima Daiichi, the plant safely stopped. It sensed the earthquake, and the control uh, ball, uh, control, con control road was withdrawn, and the reactor stopped the uh, reaction. So it, it worked completely safely. Because of the continuous maintenance and uh, quality control uh, of the operating and maintenance clues of the Fukushima Daiichi plant, the problem was tsunami. And uh, uh, this is uh, again a matter of risk management. We did not expect that high, that height of tsunami, and uh, uh, one of the panelists on the crisis management uh, this uh, this uh, morning mentioned a very interesting thing. Uh, perhaps you you you, you mentioned it, uh, or, or other panelists. Uh, we general population we uh, generally tend to be confined to the most recent accident, recent incident. And what was the recent, most recent incident for the nuclear industry before March 11th? It was earthquake. There was a very big earthquake in the northern part of uh, uh, Japan, and uh, one of the power plants, or actually seven of the power units of nuclear uh, was uh, uh, damaged and stopped operation. So uh, engineers and the management and the government interest are confined to the earthquake. And the tsunami was mentioned, yes, but tsunami, tsunami was mentioned because that is a uh, useful document to estimate how big the possible earthquake is. So the lessons were learned before March the 11th but just in terms of the most recent accident, that is, earthquake. Uh, but gradually, uh, TEPCO has been successful in convincing uh, science community and national community, and the government uh, prepared a budget for the study of the tsunami. And the tsunami study should have started on the 1st of April. That was very, very, very unfortunate. So uh, the lessons we learn, we should learn from uh, the Fukushima accident is that this is a matter of crisis management, not the technology management. Technology is there, technology was there, and we have not prepared sufficient technology for the tsunami, which we did not expect. So that technologically, we can s uh, provide the good solutions for the future expansion of nuclear. So the issue is crisis management. And uh, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Mark that the governance is very important when that developing countries is going to introduce nuclear power plant in case of severe accident. Technologically, we can uh, uh, provide a good assistance from our experience, but for, from the, uh, for the crisis management for the government, it may not be possible for any Japanese uh, uh, politicians or engineers to provide a good uh, uh, guidance or help to the governance of the uh, developing countries. So uh, lessons to be learned and gradually uh, importance of uh, uh, nuclear it will be realized and uh, it is, uh, I hope the question is about crisis management, risk management, not technology management, and the lessons to be learned in terms of crisis management and the gradual restart of uh, nuclear power in the world will start and hopefully in, in Japan again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we just only have a uh, few minutes, so uh, if there is any uh, the specific question relating on this topic, uh, I'd like to pick. Um, uh, I know the, the issues are very much inter interlocking each other and uh, interrelated each other. So the, the we are going to have. The, I'd like to keep the, the general discussion session in the end of toward the end of this uh, session. But if you have any specific question about the nuclear accident. Uh, I'd like to speak. Yes, please. Yes, in order to talk about this policy issue theme one, one of the key topics is nuclear waste. Can we deal with the nuclear waste issues? Uh, partly from the technological point of view, but partly from the social acceptance point of view. Uh, without the, you know, solving that problem, maybe some of the 
concept wouldn't be viable at all. So I was wondering how uh, the panelists would think about nuclear waste issues in terms of the social acceptance and technological issues. You know, please, uh, simple, quick quest, uh, answers. Well, first of all, um, no one uses, uh, in the, the power companies, no one uses the word nuclear waste, okay? They, they call it irradiated fuel, okay? Uh, and the reason they call it irradiated fuel is because 95% of it is recycled, okay? Only f recyclable. Only 5% is waste. Um, it's only in the United States that they refer to it as nuclear waste. And then once again, it comes back to the issue of media. It's because the media image has latched on to the negative connotation of waste, uh, which if I were to tell you right now, we, uh, we don't know what to do with the waste, or we're thinking about ways of dealing with the waste, right away the electorate doesn't like it because it sounds bad. So that's why no one says that. Uh, as for what happens with irradiated fuel, um, th this issue is highly contentious, as you know, simply because, uh, uh, once again, it comes down to who's going to pay for it all. Uh, and uh, as much as I, I focus on the supply side of electric power generation and the politics and agenda therein, uh, it's already latched into the price of nuclear power uh, per kilowatt hour, at least it originally was uh, when we talk about 6 yen per kilowatt hour. Uh, I think that moving forward, the big issue is what happens to the issue of nuclear waste, uh, got me saying it now, irradiated, <laughs> irradiated fuel. Um, and what happens to the, the, the issue of irradiated fuel for Tokyo Electric Power Corporation moving forward? Is, is this going to be fixed into uh, the price of generation for nuclear power? Uh, and as you know, there are uh, so many issues with the law on compensation for nuclear power damage and other issues that make this a very complicated legal matter, not just an economic matter or a political matter. Uh, that's the, the point I wanted to get across. Well, again, on the social side, not the technology side, because the other uh, specialists. I just want to keep the term nuclear waste uh, simply because uh, Japan renovated at great, great cost in Salafin, the, the, uh, the, the recycling facility in the UK, in the UK government, because of pr uh, supply side issues, uh, decided to scrap it. <laughs> so it will be nuclear waste again, because it will not be recycled in, in, in many ways, at least in Japan. Uh, the problem is that uh, one of the reasons why the German public is always so opposed uh, towards nuclear energy. One important issue in contrast to France, which is the most pro-nuclear country, and these are neighbors directly, which share history and everything, is the German government was more or less serious about the nuclear waste problem all the time. So you had basically every other year you had transports throughout Germany uh, with this nuclear waste, and every time demonstrations popped up, every time it got into the news again, then you had the search uh, for facilities where to put it, where to store it. Uh, that never was, this problem was never sol uh, solved. I don't know of any country who solved this problem of final disposal, and so this remained very much in the news. While all countries with few demonstrations and few public opposition like Japan and the US simply decided to keep the nuclear waste uh, in the reactors, so no debate, very simple, nobody thought about it. Actually, I didn't know that so much of the storage of these still radioactive poles were just simply sitting in the reactors and in open air after the Fukushima disaster. But this is now very much on public mind, so this will be a debate, and you cannot restart, you cannot have a re renaissance in a mature country anymore without dealing with this problem, you cannot ignore it anymore, and it's not easy to solve. Very costly, very difficult. May I comment? Uh, I'm a believer of uh, technology, and uh, uh, compared to the oil technology or coal technology, nuclear industry has just started. And the share of the nuclear within the primary energy is very, very small. So it is emerging technology. And in general, uh, every energy technology has a lifetime of uh, more than 100, say, 200 years. And yet, yes, uh, we, we, we do not have the solution for a moment, but there is a very uh, promising uh, proposal, trium molten salt uh, reactor. That can generate electricity as well as uh, uh, converting high level radioactive waste into uh, harmless material. So that the uh, although it is an embryonic stage, but 
the uh, one pilot plant was uh, uh, run in the United States and a clear proposal is being made within Japan and if the people and the government uh, agree to develop this technology, the human being uh, will have this solution within 50 years or 100 years. Okay, uh, must be picky. Yes, uh, you raise. Uh. Um, my name is Jim Bardis. I'm with the Rand Corporation. Uh, I'm concerned that no one really addressed theme one. Uh, what should Japan do? Nuclear energy is with Japan over the short term. The answers we have is it's wonderful, it's no good, and we can rely on uh, uh, technology. But you know, how about the regulatory system? I mean, is the regulatory system in place, or that was in place in Japan, looking at nuclear energy? Is that adequate for the future, or are ch have changes been made? Are they sufficient? Uh, another big problem with nuclear energy is the way the government has uh, is communication. We see that the, a lot of the problems in the United States are self-inflicted by the United States government, especially due to the arrogance of so many of the people that are in the nuclear industry themselves about poo-pooing public concerns. Uh, so I would like to hear a little bit about, given the fact that that uh, Japan has nuclear reactors, they're going to be operating over the next 10 or 15 years. What are you going to do about it? Any reaction? Yes. Uh, there are many, many lessons we, we have learned and we are learning uh, after the accident and regulatory system is run. And we have found that there are flaws, flaws, or many flaws uh, in the Japanese regulatory system uh, on the nuclear uh, accident. And one good example is the nuclear damage compensation liability law. Uh, uh, my English expression might not be correct English, but the range of Sinai by show. So that determines who is liable for the uh, accident of the nuclear power. And uh, there is a uh, 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 principle uh, of that law is uh, operators, government in case uh, of this accident, helpful as a primary, uh, uh, primary responsibility, primary liability to any losses caused by the accident. But there is a uh, uh, clause in case of extraordinary uh, deep uh, natural hazard uh, operators of the nuclear power plants will be exempted from the uh, liability. But that rule was not applied. It is not the... Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm more interested in you have an independent agency <laughs> that was looking over your shoulder and saying, and holding your feet to the fire, this plant is safe to operate or it's not safe to operate. Can, can I address this issue? Uh, because I, uh, the the equivalent of the Agency for Natural Resources and Energy, which which is under the the aegis of of METI in Japan, is is the FERC in the United States, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, and the FERC, unlike unlike METI, is is defined as an independent regulatory agency, and yet the FERC has presided over the Three Mile Island accident in 1979. Uh, 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 the, federal, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, has been, uh, perhaps gratuitously, I, I really don't know, uh, criticized f for uh, the power blackout of 2003 and the rise and fall of Enron Corporation. Uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, it has been, uh, despite being an independent regulatory agency, it, ironically enough, it's faced many of the same uh, accusations, or maybe perhaps the word allegation would be a better word, uh, of corruption, complicity, and, and so forth. So the question I would, I would pose is, does it really make much of a difference when a crisis happens, whether or not you're independent or not? Uh, and I really don't, I, I'm very skeptical. That, that makes much of a difference. Uh, I have to. Before you start to fight, let me 
cut into this. Uh, I made my point that uh, in the mid to long run, get over with it. So this is uh, the long answer. The short answer, how to deal and how to convince the public during this intermediate period is so extremely important. One of the issues which is very well recognized in Japan is that oversight was not sufficient in particular because, well, the promotion agency and the oversight agency was one. This is going to be separated. It's already decided. It's moving into this uh, direction. What would also help is an independent consumer agency just looking at safety issues of the, of the public. Uh, for example, of all these people now affected in Fukushima, an agency that supports the people and say, hey guys, I, you're in deep trouble. You will not be able to come back. Uh, how, to we, how do we do this bailout process? How do we handle an accident? In Europe, most countries uh, who, that have still nuclear have such an agency that is simply on the consumer, on the household side. Uh, this is not nuclear safety, this is public safety agency. Public safety, just the disaster process, just the safety issues from the household perspective. That would be tremendously helpful in Japan as an, as an, as an agency also. Well, handling the final process. I think this would be a good idea in this direction. There is discussion in this direction, not enough, I think. But overall, I would trust the Japanese government and uh, including, including TEPCO that, well, after running into problem, fixing it and giving, getting the governance right to make it safer and more sustainable, uh, this is usually working comparatively well in Japan, very orderly, and I would be optimistic on that side. But this would be for the phase out period, say, till 2020 or something. Okay, thank you. Um, I know uh, we can keep, co keep going this uh, kind of conversation for hours, but uh, the, we still have uh, a little bit much more interesting <laughs> issues also. So I'd like to keep uh, moving forward, and then i uh, like to, to leave uh, 20 minutes at minimum uh, for the, the, the general discussion session toward the end of this uh, session. Let me touch upon some about something about uh, the third topic. Obviously, uh, the, 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 the we uh, at least uh, need to shut down Fukushima number one and number two. At maximum, we need to shut down most of the nuclear. So the, the question is, uh, which can replace those power supply? At maximum, 50 gigawatt, uh, which is huge, uh, almost 30% of the Japanese total power supply. The, the, the issue uh, we need to focus on uh, from objective viewpoint is that uh, 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 the potential of power supply ability, not the gigawatt, but the gigawatt hour. And uh, here is a simple mass calculation uh, uh, comparing nuclear, solar, windmill, and the geothermal. Uh, if you invest one gigawatt uh, capacities uh, among, uh, on those four technologies, the operation ratio is quite different because uh, solar power can only operate in a sunny uh, days and only daytime. And the windmills obviously are only runs in, in the, the windy days. So the average operating ratio of uh, the solar panel is 12% in Japan. The Germany is 9.5 by the way. And the windmill 20% on average. So the the, the gigawatt hour, the real power supply from those technologies are the, uh, a little bit different from the original gigawatt capacity. So the, 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 having said this, uh, can uh, the renewables really replace 50 gigawatt uh, at maximum or 4.5 gigawatt the, the Fukushima at the minimum the power supply? Even the 4.5 gigawatt of Fukushima means uh, if you need to replace 4.5 gigawatt of Fukushima by solar panel, uh, you need to have a 30 gigawatt or more supply, which is almost twice as much as the German has uh, installed in the past 10 years and a very generous uh, feed-in tariff system. So this is a reality, and uh, so the, 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 this is a dilemma we are facing right now. So, uh, having said this, I'd like to open up the, the, the comment uh, for the, uh, my panelists. Sure. Yeah. There, there's a short and, and, and long-term issue. The short-term issue essentially works almost as a formula. You have cost plus utilization rate plus political will equals what your energy mix in Japan generally is. And this has been underlined historically uh, at least since 1951. It, it's actually gone in phases. Uh, and this is all empirically verifiable uh, from reliable information. It started 
with hydroelectric power until the hydroelectric uh, dams, which were actually quite cheap, relatively speaking, were all captured, as, as they say in the industry, uh, and therefore you were forced to move on to another source. Uh, it moved on to coal until they opened up the liberalization in 1961, and then you imported very cheap uh, coal, oil, and liquefied natural gas uh, up until the uh, 1973 oil shock, and then you started moving into nuclear power, which was uh, anywhere between, at the time, it only cost around 2.1 yen per kilowatt hour. Now it's up between 5.6, the range is anywhere between 5.6 and 7 yen per kilowatt hour, not including uh, TEPCO, uh, TEPCO's generation price because of the, the uh, extraordinary losses uh, and compensation issues dealing with Fukushima Daiichi. Be that as it may, now the issue is can we go to what they call new renewables, which is geothermal, solar, uh, wind, biofuels, etc. Uh, and in the short term, the answer is, well, you're dealing with what the Japanese call Kyokyu Yobiritsu, uh, reserve margin in Japan, which is 10%, which is very low internationally compared with uh, Germany and the UK and the United States, which is uh, 20% and over. And therefore, to avoid uh, rolling blackouts, which they have successfully done as a result of demand management, the issue then becomes, what do you fill in the place of nuclear power with declining reserve margins? And the answer has been predominantly, sadly, uh, as a result of it hurts the Kyoto Protocol, has been increased fossil fuels, liquefied natural gas, oil, and coal, uh, and to replace nuclear power. Uh, renewable energy, new renewables such as solar, are anywhere between 30 yen per kilowatt hour and 57 yen per kilowatt hour right now. The price is going down. But the power companies, as well as energy economists, are quite skeptical because of the intermittency issue. In other words, uh, if you were to put more solar and wind power right now, there are trade-offs, very hard choices that you need to make as a result of this. Uh, you're going to still need more fossil fuels in the event that the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining, uh, the tides aren't... Uh, there's, there's numerous issues at stake, and therefore there are always hard choices and trade-offs. Right now the answer has been, well, let's avoid that. We're not going to make that hard choice, even though politically they want... Now, Uncle Khan took a political opportunity uh, to pass a law which is very vague on what exactly the utility companies have to do. Uh, in the long term, the real issue is how far are solar, wind, uh, geothermal prices going to come down uh, on the, the cost curve, uh, and when will this happen 50 years down the line? Uh, because we're never going to have this conversation right now. It's, right now, it's going to stick with fossil fuels, sadly. Uh, with uh, a, a clear and noticeable uh, damaging of the carbon policy in Japan and the greenhouse emission gas policy, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission policy in Japan, which uh, the Japanese government has already made their thoughts clear, uh, they are not going to sign up again for the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the uh, after 2012, what will happen in terms of the next commitment period, uh, unless other countries get involved, and therefore. Uh, I think, sadly, in the short to medium term, you're going to see an increase in, most likely, uh, LNG, which are predominantly combined cycle gas turbines, uh, which are in the range of anywhere between 5 and 7 yen per kilowatt hour. Uh, and nuclear, although it's still cheaper, outside the issue of the insurance issue, which is a whole separate issue uh, uh, for Fukushima Daiichi and, and the insurance costs uh, and compensation costs, uh, for the medium term for nuclear power, it's still politically debated. On an economic issue, it's, there's, it's, it's not really debated. It's a political issue, mostly. Uh, and then for the long term, uh, no one has their crystal ball yet on where the price is going to be, uh, let alone the utilization rate, uh, 50 years from now. If I did, I wouldn't be here. I would be making billions of dollars uh, playing the stock market. Um, I wish I did, though. That's uh, the three points I'd like to make on that. Well, Again, this is, uh, in my view, a very short view, just looking at the supply side. Uh, when we look only at the supply side, we ask ourselves, nuclear or renewables? It's like, well, should we use apples or oranges? Uh, we forget about the market process with this, and this is where really the key to the solution is. So renewables are not really meant as a replacement for nuclear. This is simply not the point. Nuclear is base load. Renewables is something which is related uh, to a market process and, well, social needs in many ways and how your economy has evolved. Uh, 
base load comes from different sources. Nuclear is one in Japan, it's a stronger one in Germany, it's basically the same size. Uh, so when you decide to phase it out, you think about what to, how to replace it, and this is what the Germans did, but 10, 15 years ago, their idea was, well, photovoltaic, because we want to have this industry going as well, these Asians, these Japanese are so strong in electronics, so we do photovoltaics, although we have no sun, and uh, so we get our economy <laughs> going, and our companies, and this is a nice subsidy. Of course, they didn't work. Of course, your math is right, that this is not working in, Gen in Germany. Then you talk about desert tech, some in Africa, forget about this too. No, the point here is, technology is replacing the gap, of course. The balance between supply and demand, the place, replacing the gap is, you have to look at what your economy is. When you're an emerging country, then you build up big industry, you need big power sources, you build up a manufacturing industry. Japan has done that until 1990. From that time, Japan is cutting back. Japan is focusing on cost cutting, on becoming more efficient. This is why prices are going down. This is where the technology can be used in a smart, effective market way. And this is what's replacing the demands from the demand side. This big gap. The gap is only 30%. If you say, okay, 15% over the next 10 years, we simply replace this with efficiency with dealing with our market more efficient. This is a natural source in Japan. Oh, there's always the argument there are no natural sources for energy. This is good in a way, because it helps you tremendously to focus. So for Japan, Japan will not become a coal producer. Japan will not become an, an uranium producer. Japan will not become an oil producer. But Japan is a producer and user of technology, of smart markets, of dealing with customers. Japan is a society which diversifies from being a user of big, big steel power demand and producing it with big nuclear towards a society that is aging, that is mature and has differentiating needs, <coughs> differentiating ways of living, of doing things and you need to connect them smartly. When you connect them smartly within a company, it is very easy to cut your energy use from one year to the other, we have seen this this year, by 15%. August, supply, August uh, demand in electricity was 15% below the year before. Although the use of oil was down 10% as well. It was basically gas because it's flexible. But think about it. You would have thought oil is coming in. No. It was simply people doing things not in the smartest way because it had been done from one day to the other. Next year will be smarter. In two or three years, it will be incredibly smart. You can connect your producers, small scale, where you need them. With demand, you, you cut back on the losses. This is where the gap can be filled. And this is where technology comes in. And this is one of the original sources existing in Japan. So, the lack of supply is a source in a way, because you have to focus on the demand side. And doing things smartly is where Japan is much, much better than any emerging country. And the emerging countries are now in trouble building up the supply fast enough, and then these smart technologies come in again. And this will be a tremendous source of moving. Thanks, Professor. Yes. Uh, for the future of uh, uh, primary energy source for electricity to replace nuclear uh, might be natural gas. Uh,
by the time the increase of nuclear uh, use uh, uh, may, may stop worldwide. And in the meantime, natural gas uh, will be used. And as a, as a matter of fact, uh, TEPCO has installed lots of the gas turbines to meet the a peak load demand this summer. And uh, as you may know, the efficiency of the single gas turbine cycle is very low, uh, just uh, 30 percent or so. But we have a, a concrete plan to combine the gas turbine with steam generator and steam turbine, make it, making it combined cycle plan with efficiency higher than 60 percent. And uh, uh, there is another possibility for the improvement of efficiency up to 80 percent using fuel cell, cell technology. So the oxide fuel cell technology is being developed worldwide. And uh, uh, in the near future, we can achieve easily achieve 80 percent of uh, uh, power, power generating energy converting efficiency and making it electricity more. Uh, free uh, of uh, uh, carbon, uh, less carbon emitting electricity. And uh, I, 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 uh, I, I totally agree with what, what Martin has said. There are many opportunities left to the consumers, big consumers of, of energy. And by electrification, by uh, converting uh, their use of uh, uh, energy from direct combustion of fossil fuels to electricity motor driven technologies, then the overall efficiency, energy efficiency of the industry should be increased substantially. So by uh, increasing the energy efficiency of the gas, gas power plant combined with the demand side new technologies such as heat pump technology, direct induced combustion technology, Many technology using electricity is being proposed, and that kind of technology will further improve than the expanded share. So by, by those two uh, com combinations, use more gas and generate electricity in a more efficient way, 8%, and electrification at the demand side, then uh, carbon footprint of the uh, Japanese economy and also the overall emission of the carbon dioxide could be reduced. Let me add to this slide. This slide, so just, just one second. This slide is just wonderful. I mean, this is to have, to have it before. I mean, these are stupid cycles, right? Just on the supply side going on linear. And this is where technology comes in and the demand side, where markets are coming in, because, well, it should have gone here, the woods and so on, but bottling out at a level, because, well, it can be used by new technology in a useful way, in a regional way. This is gas. It should have increased in a stupid way like this. It didn't because, well, oil shock and industry becoming more efficient. Japan is still proud of having the most efficient manufacturing and industry, but it hasn't improved in terms of efficiency over the last 15 years anymore. Why not? Because we didn't have deregulation, because we didn't have additional forces pushing industry to become even more efficient. They were just leaving the country. Because while energy prices were stable, tech programs were pushing customers uh, to become more efficient, they were actually subsidizing when you were using more electricity. So the question would not be, well, this is technology, but how can we get these guys to become even more efficient, bring prices even more down, make it more efficient, more productive? Thank you for touching up on that issue. And uh, being in the steel industry, uh, I, I need to defend ourselves because uh, the, we are one of the, 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 the best efficient among the world in making steel, not only making steel, but producing power. And during the peak season, that last summer, we are net exporter of the power to the TEPCO rather than net importer. Uh, because we uh, recover most of the energies from wasted heat and uh, self-generated powers. So, in that sense, uh, we agree, I, I agree that we have a huge potential to, to, to transfer our know-how and the, uh, the energy management system to outside the world to save the total amount of energy consumption, not only in Japan, but globally, globally particularly in China, but 
That's probably another issue. And I coming back to the original uh, issue, uh, we have already touched up on the third topic that is about to be that, uh, the, the, the ideal mixture of energy supply or energy uh, strategy of Japan. And uh, uh, before open up the, the question session to the, 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 the forum, uh, I'd like to give the, the last opportunity for the panelists to comment on their uh, issues. But the, before doing that, I, I'd like to take that privilege of being the moderator. Uh, I'd like to share one, one uh, the, the baseline information again. Uh, the, the one big issue for the natural resources and coming back to the LNG or natural gas power generation always claim that the natural resource is running out. But uh, the, uh, outside of Japan, there is a revolution happening. Uh, you know, uh, those uh, reports uh, recently published uh, in UK and the US and uh, some other areas, uh, uh, IEA in Paris. And uh, shale gas is a the, the different shape of uh, natural gas, but uh, uh, in the past 10 years, uh, there's a revolutionary uh, discovery happened and uh, the technology development happened to utilize shale gas as a natural gas source. And uh, uh, the last uh, June, uh, the Director General of uh, the IEA claimed before the OECD uh, panel that uh, there is uh, uh, more than 20, 250 years uh, natural gas resources available, plenty of natural gas resources available on the globe. Uh, because of this natural gas uh, the revolution. So the, uh, still we have uh, the CO2 emission issue left, but uh, the, the, the supply side issue is a little bit different shape than the ordinary people think in, in Japan. Having said this, uh, I'd like to ask uh, the com commentators to uh, speak. I, I'd just like to address this issue of supply and price very briefly. Because there's a lot of international comparisons going on with uh, Germany and Denmark and Iceland and so forth for uh, a variety of suitable uh, energy mixes uh, in, in a portfolio, including the United States. But uh, the point that I would like to stress is Japan's topography uh, and the, the, uh, the structure of its electric power market right now. Unlike in Germany uh, and Denmark, for example, where you have an interconnected grid across all of Europe, you don't have that in Japan. Not only uh, connecting to the much lower electricity prices, at least three times as lower in South Korea uh, and, and Russia than from Japan, uh, but also uh, the issue within Japan itself because of the famous, or should I say notorious, uh, 50 versus 60 hertz uh, division of electric power. Uh, and in order to deal with this, uh, issues of import of supply or perhaps uh, copying what the Germans and the Danes are doing, for example, with wind and solar, not to mention other power sources, including the UK, uh, you have to deal first with the networks. Uh, who's going to pay for the construction of the network? And this is an issue which never even gets on the table, simply because of the positions very clearly stated over and over again by all of the participants. The Ministry of Finance has made its thoughts very clear on this. We are not going to be paying anymore. We have a primary surplus issue we are trying to deal with. Tax revenues continue to fall. Expenditures continue to rise. We have to issue more and more bonds just to keep, cover our expenditures. We don't want to increase subsidies and expenditures for things that may not go anywhere or may not be useful 20, 30 years down the line. Therefore, we leave it to you, the politician, to decide what we should do. But politicians, whether we're talking about the LDP or the DPJ, don't really have any clear ideas themselves about where we should go in the world, simply because the world global model is very fluid. Okay? Before, in the past, Japan was always catching up with the rest of the world, so they were following very clear blueprints on what works, who benefits, and why. Today, it's the undiscovered country. Nobody really knows where to go. And so the catch-up period is over. And the more the Japanese look abroad, whether we're looking about Shinikai, administrative advisory councils, which, whose job it is, Specifically, and I've, I've, I actually attended virtually all of them, on where we should go in terms of energy policy and electricity restructuring. The one clear thing comes out. The more you know, the less you know. And this is a sad truth. The more you study something, the less you ultimately know. To the point where you actually do what the Japanese do. And the answer is nothing. You do nothing at all. Because you're scared of your own shadow. 
And this I saw with the restructuring of the electric power industry since 1995. Everyone wanted electric power restructuring in Japan, including the communists. Why? Because the rest of the world was doing it, and it worked. Then suddenly the information started to come in around 2000. There was the California crisis. There were blackouts. There were massive price spikes in Australia and New Zealand, which were completely unanticipated. There were price hikes in, in Germany. There were companies that were going bankrupt in Germany when 100% liberalization of the market took place in 1998. Suddenly, all of this information, and believe me, all of it, was studied to death in Japan uh, at the Shinkai level, led to the conclusion that there are too many uncertainties moving forward. And so electricity liberalization stopped. It stopped in 2003. And in 2007, they decided never to even liberalize the residential section, which they were planning to do. This would not have happened had everything worked as planned abroad. So the question goes back to a suitable energy uh, source now, a portfolio. What is the best way to go moving forward? And the original idea, the original plan was, well, we'll nu uh, increase nuclear power. Because the rest of the world was doing it in the so-called renaissance. Now that question has been uh, undermined. Some people would use the word delegitimized. So what do you do? Where do you go now? And you're going to have these debates over and over again in the media. And I, so I come back to my original point. Who ultimately decides in Japan where policy is heading? And I firmly and genuinely believe it's actually the media decides. Not the politicians. <laughs> Not the bureaucrats, and certainly not Tokyo Electric Power Corporation. It's actually the media who will decide where it's going. And the media, because of Fuhen Futo, this idea of just the facts man analysis, the media has no editorial position what to take, whether you're pro or anti-nuclear, pro or anti-renewable, pro or anti-global warming. That's, a that's a, actually a very profound statement. They don't really know. And since the media doesn't really know, the General Electric doesn't really know either. And because the General Electric hasn't really a firm position on all these overlapping issues, what do you have? Nothing. You have inertia. And that essentially has been going on now. Is this going to change in the future? I would love to tell you something remarkably positive uh, and awe-inspiring so that you walk out here thinking that uh, I know exactly what's going to happen one year to ten years down the line. I really, I, I don't want to lie to you. That would be wrong. Uh, I don't know myself, but I do know where to look. And the place to look is actually in the five major dailies moving forward. That's where you should keep your eyes posted. Yes. One minute or two minutes comment. Please. I'm, I'm always, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm always too long, so I will be very short on this one and make my position clear, I think. Uh, first of all, two points you raised. Uh, the, your three points. Shale gas, from the Japan perspective, we don't have it. Wonderful for the portfolio. A little bit less CO2, very nice. I think great business for Kajima. My efficiency point, I mean, this is they need a lot of transport. They need a lot of digging and whatever. This is brilliant. I think go for it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, in terms of network, who's paying for the networks? Uh, very, very simple economics. Uh, either a network is efficient, uh, an investment, then it pays for itself as an investment with an internal interest rate and uh, with a uh, with a profit coming out of it, or it is consumption because it doesn't pay for itself, then it's a consumer choice. Do you want to have a nuclear power plant down there somewhere on a fault line standing? If you don't, pay for it. It's consumption in that case. I think most networks, when we look at them, pay for themselves. This is investment. So it's not really a question where the money comes, comes from. Media decide. Well, media don't decide. I mean, media are very important, but they don't decide. Engineers often think that consumers are stupid uh, because they do not understand the wonderful technology. Well, uh, bureaucrats, politicians sometimes think that media decide. They are usually very influential, but they do not decide. I mean, people are not that stupid. They make their decisions, their propositions, rather deal with it. This is at least the business position. Deal with it, uh, going along, seeing where the long-term trends is, where the opportunities are. My background is electricity, power engineering, so I would like to touch upon or I would like to challenge to the mindset of economists. And uh, uh, many people are nowadays talking about smart grid in order to incorporate as large uh, renewable energies as, as possible. But uh, many people are discussing 
transaction sell buy purchase electricity it is all about transaction utilizing IT technologies but the electricity is uh, is a very uh, different animal it cannot be treated as commodity in, in physics it can be treated as a commodity in economics but the electricity flow of electricity power should follow the uh, law of physics and uh, the electricity supply should respond spontaneously to the demand changes so uh, this is uh, what the economists uh, usually overlook uh, even a very fine detailed study on the possible electricity market mechanism can never solve the problem of physics Challenging the economist. <laughs> well, unpunished, of course. Economics is about transactions. This is all economists do. We deal with transactions. This is why we love this so much, and this is also why we love smart grids so much. Because about transactions. You have a supplier and you have a demand side. You have a household sitting there. At the same time, what economists do not like is time lags or anything in between. It makes things nasty. Yeah? At the same time, connecting them and building a model that works. At the same moment, this is not about transaction, storage, and stuff like this. Uh, good for your engineers with batteries. I think you're more on that side. No, no, no. It is about a balance in the economy. How to get this instantaneously working in the most efficient way. So now this no misunderstanding. Smart grid is a wonderful way of increasing productivity and efficiency in the economy because you balance immediately the supply and demand side. It's a challenge. It's not easy. Big challenge to engineers, of course, but this is what economists want, of course. Okay, uh, so the economists like a free market, so uh, let's open up the conversation to the floor. And, uh, uh, okay. Uh. Uh, can I take the issue back to the first one, nuclear uh, generation? Uh, we've talked a lot about Japan and uh, a little bit about Germany and France and so on. But we were also supposed to be talking about the world as well. And uh, clearly in most of the world, which is still the developing world, the increase in demand for uh, power is going to continue to grow very rapidly indeed. Uh, so what do you have to say to China or India, which lack uh, uh, resources other than coal? Uh, what do you have to say to them about where their base load comes from? even after you've managed to convince them to be rather more efficient in their current energy use, uh, you are looking at their demands for base power probably growing at 10% a year for uh, the next several years. Uh, what are they to do if they are to abandon nuclear energy completely and rely entirely on their own fossil fuels, which is mainly coal? Uh, having observed uh, climate change negotiations some time, uh, this is uh, a sovereign uh, decision making. What type of primary energy uh, China would like to use? And uh, China needs more power for growth, and at the same time, it is suffering from the extreme event of uh, climate change shortage of water and droughts, floods. So they are searching the uh, uh, best way to cope with both to meet energy demand and climate change. And very unfortunately, growth rate is too high to rely on renewable or nuclear. So the last resort is most easily available energy core. So what uh, developing, a developed country can do is to provide efficient technology to China or India uh, after supercritical boiler technologies and uh, uh, cold gasification integrated combined cycle technologies. What we can do for China and India is very limited. They decide by themselves. 
completely agree. Uh, it is basically about technology. The decisions are done in the countries themselves. Uh, dictating anything is just... Uh, <laughs> well, we shouldn't do it. But I, I wanted to take issue with your point that, that uh, you know, nobody wanted nuclear in developing countries if there wasn't a good example in a developed country. Now, the fact is that China is going ahead, India is going ahead regardless of the problems that have happened in Japan uh, and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, your argument doesn't seem to stand up to what's actually happening in China. Uh, in, in, in which, which terms? Well, you were suggesting that the bad example that you know, was set by what had happened in Japan was going to make it impossible to sell technology uh, to, to, to other countries. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry, this is a misunderstanding. I just said it makes it extremely difficult to do so. So basing your strategy in Japan on nuclear exports is a bad idea in the current environment. This was my only point. Uh, this is, uh, I mentioned the, in emerging countries, they will need any power source available, and uh, nuclear is part of the mix. They will go ahead with it. They face tremendous difficulties because the governance issue in India, and in, China, in India in particular, in China as well, is very, very big. People know that. People were in China were extremely concerned about the, the, uh, the Fukushima incident, extremely concerned, because, well, they know about their own gov government, and uh, the government in China said, well, this was only Japan. I mean, we are much better, much safer, better control, get the better newer technology. Of course, nobody did believe that. So, selling technology and providing technology and helping is a tremendously important point. But in the renewable and in the most efficient technologies, China and uh, emerging countries are becoming a strong competitor as well. And this should be seen as well. The, it's not only providing technology which will be a big boon to the global warming issue becoming more efficient, but also competition is heating up for future markets, from photovoltaic to wind power to whatever. Uh, companies, major wind power companies have now their world centers in China. Not at home anymore. Japan will do the same, perhaps. This is a very important market which drives growth, technology, and also uh, a solution to CO2 markets. I'm not, I'm not ruling out nuclear energy. In, in, in okay. Uh, in, in, let, let us give a chance to the, the, the presentation prepared during the conversation uh, to Mr. Affelman. Sorry to preempt here a little bit, but I've done some numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. What I'm trying to do here is take the point about what's happening globally, put it together with the demand side and the supply side at the same time, and then see what the gaps look like, and then you know, kind of guess what happens next. Okay. On uh, uh, fossil fuel supply, the numbers I've got right now are for so-called proven reserves. We've got about 1.2 trillion barrels of oil equivalent. We've got about 3.5 in coal. And we've got old gas, about 1.1. The EIA in the U.S. just did a, uh, an estimate in April of this year, estimating that usable sh new shale gas, that's the shale gas shop, uh, shop uh, would provide about the equivalent of all of the oil we've got in the ground now. That's an amazing number. Add them all up, you got 6.8. Okay? So that's the more or less supply side. Demand. Very simplistic. We start with about 96, uh, was it 96? A thousand million barrels a day, so 96 billion barrels a day in the current total primary energy use, more or less. And then what I do is I repeat to get a demand path. I repeat this miracle from the last 20 years. We've had three and a half percent GDP growth. We've had two percent primary energy growth. That's kind of a miracle. When I was a boy, we used to think it was one to one, but it's only been about one five months. So let's just let that growth rate go. Bring it. Spouring point, two percent per year. Add up all the energy we need over the next fifty years, you get eight point four trillion barrels. Okay, so we've got a gap already. So the real question is, how do we fill that gap? Is it nukes? Is it renewables? What's the technology? A couple of weeks ago, we invited uh, Michio Kaku, the uh, American, uh, Japanese American uh, uh, physicist, to come talk to our uh, group in, in New York, and he said something that I thought was absolutely amazing. Going back to Paul's point before. The uh, renewable cost per kilowatt hour is going to be coming down. Okay. Uh, he added that the fossil fuel cost per kilowatt hour will be going up. We'll see what happens with the shale gas, if it's really usable or not. But it will go up. Okay. 
what I found amazing from Kaku's uh, speech is he thought the crossover point was only 10 years in the future. Now, I'm, I hope people have some comments on that. I don't know about that. What's not in this graph is where are the nukes? Is it really six cents per kilowatt hour? Or are the capital costs actually a lot higher, the decommissioning costs higher, the waste costs higher, the insurance costs higher? What about the fuel costs? If everybody goes into nukes, do we have enough uranium? Are we really going to use all that plutonium if we don't? So we don't know where the new cost per uh, kilowatt hour is. But what I would suggest is let's think about this graph in the context of the gap between these two things. So that's the portfolio issue. Okay. The, the reason I, I, I hesitate to, to put much credence into this graph is because of the intermittency issue. For, oh, oh, serious, yeah. Uh, the, the problem with, with solar and wind and so forth is simply it is not, you keep hearing the word today, baseload. Nuclear is baseload as well as hydro. In other words, they run 24 hours a day. And in theory, they were supposed to get cheaper over time. Turns out with nuclear power, it didn't get cheaper over time. The price actually went up, but it had nothing to do with the generation costs. It had to do with compensation costs on NIMBY issues to pay off the local governments. No one uses the word pay off in, in the media. They, they use another word. Uh, but um, they, to, to deal with the nuclear plants being cited. But that's a separate issue. For the intermittency issue for solar and wind, uh, are these technological issues going to be resolved within 10 years' time? I'm highly skeptical. Uh, so I want to ask Dr. Bunsen, what is the state of battery technology now? Because if, we, if there's a solution to the intermittency area, that's where it has to come from. Where are we on batteries? Yes. Uh, from the electric engineering uh, engineer's viewpoint, uh, uh, we are cautious about renewable energies, not only because of, of the intermittency, uh, in, in other terms, uh, it is not dispatchable. A dispatch is a special terminology used by the power company uh, to control the output of the power centers from the central controlling system. Uh, but there are, there are many good uh, dispatchable uh, renewable energies, geothermal, tidal, hydro, concentrated solar heat, biofuel, optic. So uh, uh, as long as the economy fits, then we have no problems with those renewable energies. Uh, Large-scale wind farm might be all right, but photovoltaic is very, very challenging. Not because of inter its intermittency, but because of it, its uh, nature of generation. It generates DC current. And the DC current should be connected to AC grid via inverters. And the inverter technology is not robust enough to keep the uh, frequency of, of power. And in order to solve uh, the intermittency problem of uh, photovoltaic to make it dispatchable, battery could be a solution. But the drawback of the battery is that it produces DC electricity. Again, it should be con uh, converted to uh, AC via inverter, very vulnerable instrument. So in order to keep the stability of frequency of the AC grid, battery cannot solve the problem. Only from uh, storage can solve this problem. Okay, uh, I know uh, many people like to say or ask uh, many other questions, and uh, uh, but uh, we unfortunately we are, we are running out of uh, time. So maybe I just give one minute each uh, the, the panelists for the final last word. Starting from Mr. Tachikawa. Perhaps I should repeat what uh, I should repeat what uh, I said earlier, and, and other people uh, this morning said uh, the nuclear accident. Uh, it, it is a, a lesson to be learned and in terms of crisis management rather than technology. So uh, the technology of the nuclear uh, will have a different future, but the crisis management uh, we experience in Japan poses lots of questions to be solved and discussed. Just adding to the graph, uh, I was talking about the whiteboard, uh, the 
Danish government expects to be by 50% without uh, additional cost, 50% of uh, all energy use in Denmark by 2020, and the Germans believe they can do this by 2020, uh, 2030. You can challenge that, but they have been putting about 10 years of research into that, and that is their answer. So at least I would consider such answers, because, well, renewable costs are coming down. And what you also have to see is that for consumers, you have additional value just beyond the supply costs of what you have to pay. When you insulate your window, you can sit close to the window. It's wonderful. It feels so much better when temperature in your house is not going up by 5, 10 degrees uh, from, uh, from, from, from noon to, to, to evening. This is additional. Uh, my point that I stressed throughout the session is what's not added and included here are the efficiency gains. Yes. The efficiency gains. This is probably the biggest source in a mature economy you can have because we are already at this high level. Japan will probably be able to become an active country if we would connect ourselves to, to, to China or wherever because of the levels already. The efficiency gains are a tremendous source, not only of being more sustainable, but also in terms of profits, of technology and what you can do. Smart grids connecting people better, new technology saving, internal rate of return. McKinsey did a study for companies. If you fix the internal rate of return on, on cutting back on in energy efficiency in corporations, they will be more efficient by 20, they can save 20% of what they are doing so far. This is amazing. And in particular Japan, being one of the most mature countries in the world, focusing for 20 years now on cost cutting, I think Japan is a tremendous source of income. Uh, according to the International Energy Agency in 2000, Japan had the highest electricity prices in the world. Uh, Japan no longer has the highest electricity prices in the world, neither in nominal or in real terms. Now, that dubious honor goes to countries like Denmark. Uh, why does Denmark have among the highest electricity prices in the world? You'd be surprised to learn that 50% of it is tax. Okay, where are all these taxes going? So they have, they have much lower electricity costs without taxes. But well, to I the consumer, the but to the yes, consumer, no, who cares? The government uses it for meaningful things, but TEPCO was just wasting it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it might be true. Um, but uh, for the business, the industrial consumer, uh, the end result is the same. Prices are still high. Now, Japan's prices are unfortunately very high. Oh, no, the Germans have lower industrial costs because they subsidize it for the, for the, for the steel guys so that they will well, uh, Right now, Japan's average industrial uh, tariff, electricity price per kilowatt hour, uh, is around 15 yen per kilowatt hour. The residential is about 22, it's around 22 yen per kilowatt hour. If uh, Japan were to go the way of renewables, uh, as uh, Rami Feldman suggests might happen within 10 years time. Where do electricity prices go within 10 years? Now, K. Donren has already made their thoughts very clear. Uh, we don't want our electricity prices going up anymore. Uh, neither does METI. METI has also said we're, we're trying to deal with the price issue. We, the theory was the prices were supposed to be coming down. Okay. Now we're suddenly getting involved in a completely different agenda. We're now talking about renewables uh, and the subsidies, which are uh, not only the, I'm, I'm actually uh, sad to say that we never talked once about the feed-in tariff issue uh, today, but feed-in tariffs have to be uh, the subsidization of renewable energy, which actually pushes up the price because it's simply uneconomical to deal with renewable energy right now from an investment point of view, unless you are subsidized in various ways. Uh, so where will electricity prices go in 10 years' time uh, if, you don't, if you don't invest in renewables? Uh, and sadly, as it's already been pointed out, fossil fuel prices are already going up. So what do you rely on? Well, the only other base load that's there is nuclear, which is politically unattractive for obvious reasons. Sorry? Well, economically, you have, pol you have politically, socially, and economically. And Politi is, that's pretty tough. Though. Politically, is, social, well, that's socially. Health yes, health is social. Politically, oh, economic, and social. The, the, the social, the political issues right now are, are, are polarized. The economic issues have now been called into question. It's unclear. And the social issue is actually, well, the social issue is all over the board. There are, because right now the peer-reviewed journals like Energy Policy are currently debating the health issues 
uh, and I've, I can show you actually, it's quite interesting, you'll probably find it useful. Where are the, the health issues for nuclear power plants now? Not only around France, they do a lot of studies on France, but also Japan. Okay. Uh, we can keep, uh, again, we can keep discussion on um, next uh, few hours. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, and 85 minutes covering the, the, one of the most important the issue in Japan is almost impossible, mission impossible, but uh, we covered most of the issues. And uh, I hope you understand the dilemma between cost, technology, uh, short term, long term, and uh, the, the supplyability and so forth. Everything is interconnected. There is no simple answer, as you understand this, from this discussion. But uh, the reality is we need to face this fact, uh, reality. And in the long run, technology may solve most of the issues. Uh, it is a change improvement or supply side or new uh, lower cost renewables and whatever, whatever. But in the mid term or short term, there is no simple answer. That is a reality, and uh, 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 we need to keep discussing. And uh, the, pro the only way to go is having debate and the dis open discussion. This kind between now and the next year when the, the government is going to determine long-term energy supply strategy. So uh, this is, uh, I hope this is a kind of a, the initial uh, discussion to be continued for the next uh, months. Thank you for coming.